Hi, this is Brad Constantine, and this is a podcast recording of the Doctrine and Covenants of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Even though this is not an official recording of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, every effort has been made to be as doctrinally and historically accurate as possible. Every day a new section of the Doctrine and Covenants will be released. I hope that you'll visit this often and be able to share this uh, with your friends. Thank you. Hi, and welcome back to the Doctrine and Covenants podcast. This will be for section 98, and it's uh, coincidental maybe uh, today that I'm actually recording this is July the 4th, 2020, and I'll ha- I happen to be covering uh, about the Constitution here in section 98. Coincidence? I don't know. Okay, section 98 heading, Revelation given through Joseph Smith the prophet at Kirtland, Ohio, August the 6th, 1833. This revelation came in consequence of the persecution upon the saints in Missouri. Increased settlement of church members in Missouri troubled some other settlers who felt threatened by the saints' numbers, political and and economic influence, and cultural and religious differences. In July 1833, a mob destroyed church property, tarred and feathered two church members, and demanded that the saints leave Jackson County. Although some news of the problems in Missouri had no doubt reached the prophet in Kirtland, 900 miles away, the seriousness of the situation could have been known to him at this date only by revelation. So just a little background on this one. The church is politically neutral. It does not endorse political parties, platforms, or candidates. Candidates should not imply that they are endorsed by the church or its leaders. Church leaders and members should avoid any statements or conduct that might be interpreted as church endorsement of political parties or candidates. Members should do their civic duty by supporting measures that strengthen society morally, economically, and culturally. Members are urged to be actively engaged in worthy causes to improve their communities and make them wholesome places in which to live and rear families. That was out of the Church Handbook of Instructions. The First Presidency has said, We strongly urge men and women to be willing to serve on school boards, city and county councils and commissions, state legislatures, and other high offices of either election or appointment. Elder M. Russell Ballard, in the church we often state the couplet, be in the world but not of the world. Perhaps we should state the couplet as two separate admonitions. First, be in the world, be involved, be informed, try to be understanding and tolerant and to appreciate diversity, make meaningful contributions to society through service and involvement. Second, be not of the world, do not follow wrong paths or bend to accommodate or accept what is not right. Members of the church need to influence more than we are influenced. We should work to stem the tide of sin and evil instead of passively being swept along by it. We each need to help solve the problem rather than avoid or ignore it. With this principle in mind, trying to solve the problem, what is the church's position on homeschooling? Should we take our children out of the public school system or try to help make the the public school system better? Thomas S. Monson said, The church has always had a vital interest in public education and encourages its members to participate in parent-teacher activities and other events designed to improve the education of our youth. In a letter from the Church Educational System dated the 16th of November 2000, the church is neutral regarding homeschooling. The manner of education of children is considered to be the parents' decision. President Gordon B. Hinckley said, It is amazing what courtesy will accomplish. It is tragic what a lack of courtesy can bring. We see it every day as we move in the traffic of of the cities in which we live. A moment spent in letting someone else get into the line does does good for the one who is helpful, and it also does good for the one who helps. Something happens inside of us when we are courteous and deferential toward others. It is all part of a refining process which, if persisted in, will change our very natures. All right, verse 1. Verily I say unto you, my friends, fear not, let your hearts be comforted, yea, rejoice evermore, and in everything give thanks, waiting patiently on the Lord, for your prayers have entered into the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth, and are recorded with this seal and testament. The Lord hath sworn and decreed that they shall be granted. Therefore he giveth this promise unto you with an immutable covenant, that they shall be fulfilled, and all things wherewith you have been afflicted shall work together for your good, and to my name's glory, saith the Lord." The first three verses of this section must have tested the faith of some of the of the saints, for in the month before this revelation was received, the saints had seen the effects of unrestrained mobs. On the 20th of July, 1833, a mob had gathered at the courthouse in Independence, called in the leaders of the church in Missouri, and demanded that they prepare to leave Jackson County. 
The leaders asked for three months to consider their requests. When that request was denied, they asked for ten days. The mob refused and granted them only fifteen minutes. When the elders did not accept the mob's Ill illegal and unreasonable demands, the mob determined to destroy the offices of the Evening and Morning Star immediately. The printing shop and the residence of W. W. Phelps were completely demolished, as was the store run by Sidney Gilbert. Even this destruction was not sufficient to satisfy these men. They broke into the houses of the saints, searching for the leading elders. Men, women, and children ran in all directions, not knowing what would, be, what would befall them. They caught Bishop Partridge and Charles Allen and dragged them a half a mile to the public square. I just lost my place. Okay, public square where they were given two alternatives, deny the Book of Mormon or consent to leave the county. The Book of Mormon they would not deny, nor would they consent to leave the county. Bishop Partridge was granted permission to speak. His words were drowned by the tumultuous crowd, many of whom were shouting, Call on your God to deliver you and your, pre and your pretty Jesus you worship. The mob stripped Partridge and Allen of their clothing, smeared their bodies with tar mixed with pearl ash, a flesh-eating acid, and emptied a pillow of feathers over them. This indignity was endured with such resignation and meekness that the mob began, became ashamed. Their sympathies touched. They permitted the two abused men to retire in silence. On the 23rd of July, 1833, 500 men rushed into independence, waving a red flag and brandishing guns, dirks. I'm not sure what a dirk is. Uh, maybe you can look that up on the Internet. D-I-R-K-S. Don't have a clue. Whips and clubs. Must be some sort of weapon, but I don't know what kind. With oaths and curses, they searched for the leading elders of the church, threatening to whip the ones they captured with from 50 to 500 um, lashes. Negroes owned by members of the mob laid waste the crops of the saints. Dwellings were demolished by the mob as they threatened. We will rid Jackson County of the Mormons peaceably if we can, forcibly if we must. If they will not go without... We will whip and kill the men. We will destroy their children and ravish their women. To save the lives of the saints, Edward Partridge, William Phelps, Isaac Morley, A. Sidney Gilbert, John Whitmer, and John Carrill offered themselves as a ransom for the lives of their brethren to be scourged or put to death if need be. For this noble gesture, their names will be remembered forever in the annals of the church. But the mob, insensible to this noble manifestation of love, scoffed at the six leaders and with brutal imp imprecations swore they would flog every man, woman, and child until the Mormons agreed to leave the county. Leave the county or die was the demand. It was in this setting that the Lord called on the saints to rejoice evermore and in everything give thanks and, rem and reminded them that all things wherewith you have been afflicted shall work together for your good. This was a call to show great faith in God. It can be harder to feel gratitude to God in the face of persecution than in times of peace and plenty. The promise that all things work for the good of the righteous is repeated in several other places. The meaning is that even the evil designs of men in the hands of the master workman will will turn out for the benefit of the people of, of God and for his glory. The divine will overrules all things for the final good of his children. We can see this exemplified in the history of the Latter-day Saints. Verse 4, And now verily I say unto you, concerning the laws of the land, it is my will that my people should observe to do all things whatsoever I command them. Regarding the relationship of the church and the state, none have stated the matter better than James E. Talmadge, who wrote, In the case of a conflict between the requirements made by the revealed word of God and those imposed by the secular law, which of these authorities would the members of the church be bound to obey? In answer, the words of Christ may be applied. It is the duty of the people to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. At the present time, the kingdom of heaven, as an earthly power with a reigning king, exercising direct and personal authority, authority in temporal matters has not been established upon the earth. The branches of the church as such and the members composing the same are subjects of the several governments within whose separate realms the church organizations exist. In this day of comparative enlightenment and freedom, there is small cause for expecting any direct interference with the rights of private worship and individual devotion, except uh, he, he didn't live during COVID-19 time when uh, we have lost a lot of our freedoms, including uh, the freedom of religion, at least for the present. 
Okay, where was I? Uh, no earnest soul is cut off from communion with his God and with such an open channel of communication. Relief from burdensome laws and redress for grievances may be sought from, from the power that holds control of nations. Pending the overruling of providence in favor of religious liberty, it is the duty of the saints to submit themselves to the laws of their country. Nevertheless, they should use every proper method as citizens or subjects of their several governments to secure for themselves and for all men the boon of freedom in religious service. It is not required of them to suffer without protest, impo without protest, imposition by lawless persecutors or through the operation of unjust laws, but their protests should be offered in legal and proper order. The saints have practically demonstrated their acceptance of the doctrine that it is better to suffer evil than to do wrong by purely human opposition to unjust authority. And if by thus submitting themselves to the laws of the land in the event of such laws being unjust and subversive of human freedom, the people be prevented from doing the work appointed them of God, they are not to be held accountable for the failure to act under the higher law. While imprisoned at Liberty Jail, the Prophet Joseph Smith wrote, The Constitution of the United States is a glorious standard. It is founded in the wisdom of God. It is a heavenly banner. It is to all those who are privileged with the sweets of liberty, like the cooling shades and refreshing waters of a great rock in a thirsty and weary land. It is like a great tree under whose branches men from every clime can be shielded from the burning rays of the sun. Verse 5, and that law of the land which is constitutional, supporting that principle of freedom and maintaining rights and privileges, belongs to all mankind and is justifiable before me. Joseph Smith said, it is one of the first principles of my life and one that I have cultivated from my childhood, having been taught it by my father to allow everyone that liberty of conscience. I am the greatest advocate of the Constitution of the United States there is on the earth. In my feelings, I am always ready to die for the protection of the weak and oppressed in their just rights. Verse 6, Therefore I, the Lord, justify you and your brethren of my church in befriending that law which is the Constitution of the United States, I'm sorry, which is the constitutional law of the land. And as pertaining to law of man, whatsoever is more or less than this cometh of evil. I, the Lord God, make you free. Therefore ye are free indeed, and the law also maketh you free. Without freedom there can be no salvation. To compel choice is to deny choice. Agency, which is the power to act on choices that have been made that have been freely made, was the gift of God to each of his spirit children at the time of their spirit birth, and is the God given right of every soul born into this world. It can be set down as an eternal principle that that which enhances the freedom of choice comes from God, and that which enslaves and limits the power of action comes from the Prince of Darkness. That was by Joseph Elam McConkie. As is this, every law that has come from God and every wise and just law found in the governments of men has been established to preserve and protect the freedom of those for whom it was given. Verse 9, Nevertheless, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Wherefore, honest men and wise men should be sought for diligently, and good men and wise men ye should observe to uphold. Otherwise, whatsoever is less than these cometh of evil. As a book cannot exceed the wisdom and spirit of its writer, so will the system of government given a particular people never rise above the character of those chosen to lead. This principle was emphasized by King Mosiah when he related that monarchy is a good form of government if the king is righteous. Therefore, if it were possible that you could have just men to be your kings, who would establish the laws of God and judge this people according to his commandments. Yea, if ye could have men for your kings who would do even as my father Benjamin did for this people, I say unto you, if this could always be the case, then it would be expedient that ye should always have kings to rule over you. On the other hand, he has he also emphasized the power of a wicked king. He, en he enacteth laws and sendeth them forth among his people, yea, laws after the manner of his own wickedness, and whosoever doth not obey his laws, he causeth to be destroyed. And whosoever doth rebel against him, he will send his armies against them to war, and if he can, if he, can he will destroy them. And thus an unrighteous king doth pervert the ways of all righteousness." In an official statement of the First Presidency issued January the, uh, 1928, Heber, C, or Heber J. Grant and his counselors proclaim, Laws which are enacted for the protection of society have no value except when they are administered in righteousness and justice, and they cannot be so administered if dishonest men occupy administrative offices. The Lord says, When the wicked rule, the people mourn. Wise men, good men, patriotic men are to be found in all communities, in all political parties, among all 
creeds. None but such men should be chosen without beneficent laws righteously administered. The foundations of civilization crumble. Anarchy reigns. Decay and disillusion follow. We call upon all members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints throughout the world to honor the laws of God and obey and uphold the laws of the land. And we appeal to good men and women everywhere, regardless of creed, party affiliation, race, or condition, to join with us in an effort to put into operation the words of Lincoln, the great emancipator, that our country may continue to be a light to the world, a loyal, law-abiding, God-fearing nation. Verse 11, And I give unto you a commandment, that ye shall forsake all evil, and cleave unto all good, that ye shall live by every word that proceedeth forth from the mouth of God. For he will give unto the faithful line upon line, precept upon precept, and I will try you and prove you herewith. And whoso layeth down his life in my cause for my name's sake shall find it again, even life eternal. Therefore, be not afraid of your enemies, for I have decreed in my heart, saith the Lord, that I will prove you in all things, whether you will abide in my covenant, even unto death, that you may be found worthy. For if ye are will not abide in my covenant, ye are not worthy of me. Therefore, renounce war and proclaim peace, and seek diligently to turn the hearts of the children to their fathers, and the hearts of the fathers to their children. So if we could just convince all the wicked people to do their gene genealogy and family history, we'd, we'd avoid a lot of wars, it looks like. Huh, good idea. Verse 17, And again, the hearts of the Jews unto the prophets, and the prophets unto the Jews, lest I come and smite the whole earth with a curse, and all flesh be consumed before you before me. Let not your hearts be troubled, for in my Father's house are many mansions, and I have prepared a place for you, and where my Father and I am, there ye shall be also. Behold, I, the Lord, am not well pleased with many who are in the church at Kirtland, for they do not forsake their sins and their wicked ways, the pride of their hearts and their covetousness and all their detestable things, and observe the words of wisdom and eternal life which I have given unto them. Verily I say unto you that I, the Lord, will chasten them and will do whatsoever I list, if they do not repent and observe all things whatsoever I have said unto them. And again I say unto you, if ye observe to do whatsoever I command you, I, the Lord, will turn away all wrath and indignation from you, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. Now I speak unto you concerning your families, if men will smite you or your families once, and ye bear it patiently, and revile not against them, neither seek re revenge, ye shall be rewarded. Now as I begin to read this, uh, beginning in verse 23, uh, this principle here is known as the principle of, re of retribution, and this was used by the Nephites as they fought the Lamanites, and so you'll probably recognize this a little bit as we get into it. Uh, verse 24, but if ye bear it not patiently, it shall be accounted unto you as being meted out as a just measure unto you. In other words, if you retaliate against an enemy that's fought against you, then it sounds like you deserve to be, to be smitten in the first place. Verse 25, And again, if your enemy shall smite you the second time, and you revile not against your enemy, and bear it patiently, your reward shall be an, uh, an hundredfold. And again, if he shall smite you the third time, and ye bear it patiently, your reward shall be doubled unto you fourfold. And these three testimonies shall stand against your enemy, if he repent not, and shall not be blotted out. And now, verily I say unto you, if that enemy shall escape my vengeance, that he be not brought into judgment before me, then ye shall see to it that ye warn him in my name, that he come no more upon you, neither upon your family, even your children's children, unto the third and fourth generation. And then, if he shall come upon you, or your children, or your children's children, unto the third and fourth generation, I have delivered thine enemy into thine hands. Now this is the same principle that was used by Nephi in defending himself against Laban. Uh, and we don't have time to go into that right now, but that's the principle that justified Nephi being able to kill Laban. Verse 30, And then if thou wilt spare him, thou shalt be rewarded for thy righteousness, and also thy children, and thy children's children, unto the third and fourth generation. Nevertheless, thine enemy is in thine hands, and if thou rewardest him according to his works, thou art justified, if he has sought thy life. And thy life is endangered by him, thine enemy is in thine hands, and thou art justified. So in other words, after these three times, uh, it comes again the fourth time, you're justified to defend yourself, and if need be, to kill him. Verse 32, Behold, this is the law I gave, I gave unto my servant Nephi, and thy fathers Joseph, and Jacob, and, and Isaac, and Abraham, and all mine enemies, and all my ancient prophets and apostles. And again, this is the law that I give unto mine ancients, that they should not go out unto battle against any nation, kindred, tongue, or people, save I, the Lord, command them, commanded them. And if any nation, tongue, or people should proclaim war against them, they should first 
lift the standard of peace unto that people, nation, or tongue. And if that people did not accept the offering of peace, neither the second nor the third time, they, they should bring these testimonies before the Lord. Then I, the Lord, would give unto them a commandment and justify them in going out to battle against that nation, tongue, or people. And I, the Lord, would fight their battles and their children's battles and their children's children's until they had avenged themselves on all their enemies to the third and fourth generation. Behold, this is an ensample unto all people, saith the Lord your God, for justification before me. And again, verily I say unto you, if after thine enemy has come upon thee the, the first time, he repent and come unto thee pray, praying thy forgiveness, thou shalt forgive him, and shalt hold it no more as a testimony against thine enemy. And so on unto the second and third time, and, on, and as often as thine enemy repenteth of the trespass wherewith he has trespassed against thee, thou shalt forgive him until seventy times seven. Now that's not a fixed number, that's just a symbol of perfection, that you're supposed to forgive them perfectly. Seven meaning perfect, seventy is ten times that, so perfectly perfect. Verse 41, And if he trespass against thee and repent not the first time, nevertheless thou shalt forgive him. And if he trespass against thee the second time and repent not, nevertheless thou shalt forgive him. And if he trespass against thee the third time, and repent not, thou shalt also forgive him. But if he trespass against thee the fourth time, thou shalt not forgive him, but shalt bring these testimonies before the Lord, and they shall not be blotted out until he repent, and reward thee fourfold in all things wherewith he has trespassed against thee. And if he do this, thou shalt forgive him with all thine heart, and if he do not this, I the Lord will avenge thee of thine enemy an hundredfold. And upon his children, and upon his children's children, of all them, that hate me unto the third and fourth generation. But if the children shall repent on the children's or the children's children and turn to the Lord their God with all their hearts and with all their might, mind, and strength and restore fourfold for all their trespasses wherewith they have trespassed or wherewith their fathers have trespassed or their fathers' fathers, then thine indignation shall be turned away, and, re and vengeance shall no more come upon them, saith the Lord thy God, and their trespasses shall never be brought any more as a testimony before the Lord against them. Amen. Just a little more narrative here. Christians enter war, they do not begin it. Even when it, be, in it, when it came to taking the initiative in what would appear to be a noble cause to go into the mountains and root out the, the secret combinations, the sensitive Gidgadoni declined the suggestion and explained that if they did that, his people would not enjoy the approbation and thus the strength of the Lord. George Q. Cannon said, We must proclaim peace, do all in our power to appease the wrath of our enemies, make any sacrifice that honorable people can to avert war with all its horrors entailing, as it does dreadful consequences so numerous that they cannot be mentioned. It is our duty, I say, as a nation. The influence of the Latter-day Saints should be used in this direction. We should seek to quell these feelings of anxiety, to fight, and to shed blood. Our influence should go forth like oil poured upon the troubled waters, quieting the waves of discontent and wrath that are aroused by this fearful spirit. Not only ought we to extend the offering of peace the first time to a nation that proclaims war against us, but again the second time, and if that should be rejected again the third time, and if it be rejected the third time, then they should bring these testimonies before the Lord. Go to the Lord and say, Here are our testimonies. We have offered peace the first time. We have offered it twice. We have offered it three times, but our offerings are rejected. And this nation is determined to have war with us. Now we bring these testimonies before thee, before thee, Lord, I do not look for our nation to do this. It is scarcely to be expected in the nature of things that they would do it, but it is the true principle, and we as a people should use our influence for this purpose. Our prayers should ascend to God. Our petitions should ascend to the government of our nation to do everything that honorable people can to avert war. We have, to f we have no fear of the effect of the combination against us, but the promise of God is that if we do, if we do right as a nation, if we will serve him, they shall not have power over us or be able to bring us into bondage, and in the end we shall prevail. This is a glorious promise which is made to the inhabitants of the land. To us as Latter-day Saints, these principles are of the utmost importance. I do not want to see our young men get filled with the spirit of war and be eager for the conflict. God forbid that such a spirit should prevail in our land, or that we should contribute in any manner to the propagation of a spirit that, of that kind. But one may say, it is not our duty 
Is it not our duty to defend our country and our flag? Is it not our duty to maintain the institutions which the Lord has given to us? Certainly it is, and it is no part of cowardice to take the plan that the Lord has pointed out. No man need be afraid that the Lord or any just man will look upon him as a coward. The principle behind this counsel apparently is related to the principle of repentance, as is indicated in the statement by President Joseph Fielding Smith. The law of forgiveness and retribution applies to individuals and to families, as well as to the church at large. We are under co a commandment to forgive our enemies and suffer them abuses and smiting the first time and second time, also the third time. This is to be done in patience and in humility and prayer, hoping that the enemy might repent. If the enemy come upon us for the fourth time, we are justified in meeting out retribution. But even then, there is to come a reward if we patiently endure, and the Lord will reward us abundantly. For all these abuses, we will be rewarded if we endure them in patience. Perchance the enemy may repent, and that he and that we should most sincerely desire. This may, to the most ordinary human being, be a hard law to follow, but nevertheless it is the word of the Lord. One of the best illustrations of this spirit of enduring wrong rather than retaliating is found in the story of the people of Ammon in the Book of Mormon. Because they refused to take up arms to defend themselves, but would rather lay down their lives than shed blood even in their own defense, they brought many of their enemies to repentance and to the kingdom of God. This is the doctrine of Jesus Christ as taught in the Sermon on the Mount. If all people would accept this doctrine, there could be no war, and all difficulties could be adjusted in righteousness. This doctrine was taught, so the Lord declared to, to his people anciently. There are many things in the Old Testament in, re, in relation to the wars and battles of the Israelites in the, in the meager record which has come down to us, which are made to appear to us that these people were cruel and vengeful. But the Lord says that they... That says they went out to battle when they were guided by prophets in the spirit of revelation when the Lord commanded them. And that was by Joseph Fielding Smith. I bear testimony that these things are true and that as we um, uphold the constitution of the land and do the things we can to uh, peacefully uh, fix laws that aren't right, that we might have our Lord's, the Lord's Spirit to help us to do that. And I bear testimony of these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. See you next time. Bye.